Just a moment. Warning, viewer discretion is advised for people who get motion sick easily. Six degrees of freedom, defined as the ability to freely move and rotate a rigid body in a three-dimensional space, forward and backward, up and down, left and right, and the ability to pitch, yaw, and roll. It was a major selling point for the Descent games, and it applied to Forsaken, too. Well, they also had the ads showing a woman with rub-on tattoos of the game logo, which probably helped a bit. You play a mercenary, returning to the remnants of Earth to salvage whatever's left after a subatomic experiment gone wrong caused a chain reaction which destroyed the planet. However, there were several robotic sentinels and security systems still in place, which you'll have to get past first, as well as other mercenaries and bounty hunters. You might not know that playing the N64 port because the intro cutscene from the PC and PlayStation versions isn't here. A subatomic experiment gone wrong caused an uncontrollable fusion reaction to rip through planet Earth. The human infestation purged from the planet, and the Earth, a wasteland mastered by machines. Wait a minute, that voiceover for the N64 version sounds familiar. The N64 version also censored out much of the violence from the other versions and doesn't have many of the sounds or voice clips from them. It doesn't show the character backgrounds and, more helpfully, ship statistics. The levels are different, the HUDs are different, and even the objectives are different. On the PC, you get a rear-view camera and a missile cam for certain secondary weapons, and on the PC and PlayStation versions, you can pick up things like gold bars and crystals, so you're sort of being a scavenging mercenary. But usually you're taking up missions in various areas, because whatever. Forsaken sort of does six degrees of freedom. I say sort of because at several points it automatically flips your ship to face a certain way in certain rooms. That's probably due to the lack of a way to roll, at least for the N64 version. So really it's... five degrees of freedom, I guess? Either way, I was relieved that the controls are actually decent. This was around the time PC-to-console adaptations were extremely hit and miss. Six buttons and the control stick are all assigned to movement. The control stick adjusts your view, A and B move forward and backward, and the C buttons slide or strafe in their respective directions. Z and R are primary and secondary fire, while down on the D-pad and right on the D-pad switch primary and secondary weapons. Surprisingly, switching weapons doesn't feel awkward, as it still allows you to move and fire either weapon while doing so. Adjusting to basic movement is pretty simple. I got the hang of it by the midpoint of the first stage. Aiming and handling ship speed is another matter. It takes a while to get used to navigating narrow corridors, or dodging enemy fire while taking out ships, tanks, and turrets, which is part of why this game is considered so difficult. That and it may just be my colorblindness, but some enemies, usually the more common ones, blend in with several of the backgrounds. Something I do like about the enemies is the way they attack. Okay, I don't like how they can detect your presence through doors. And I don't like how some levels start you off in the same room as some enemies, so you get blindsided immediately. But this isn't the kind of game where you can just circle strafe everything to death, as not every enemy behaves the same. Some enemies aim their shots not based on where you are when they fire, but by tracking your movement and firing where you will end up. Of course, that means you can shimmy strafe instead of circle strafe, or circle strafe vertically, but that doesn't always work. Especially not if the enemy can create gravity wells to lock you in place. Then when the game introduces bounty hunter ships, their erratic movement patterns almost make it seem like you're facing someone in multiplayer, which... Yeah, this game has multiplayer. There's some solid variety to the primary and secondary weapons. Five of the former, nine of the latter. Plus things like ammo drops, power pods, orbital turrets, etc. Five primaries may not sound like much variety, but they're each quite different in some key aspect like the ability to charge shots with the Trojax, the instant damage and reach of the laser beam, the reflective properties and recoil of the transpulse, or the sus gun being a complete waste of time. Each mission has a different goal, but for the most part they involve either killing all enemies, getting an item and returning to the spawn point, defeating a boss, collecting X amount of items, activating a beacon and waiting a minute for extraction, or the bane of my existence, aka protection missions. The Beacon ones are a bit unusual, as they're essentially boss levels in which you don't, or can't, defeat the boss. You willow down their health until a beacon drops, then forget about the boss, go for the beacon, and try not to get shot. Also, the mission text can be baffling. 
Like when you're warned that enemy forces are gathering to destroy you, and the objective is to... Go to the rally point and try to wipe them out. And you know why? Because we're idiots? Right. <laughs> the level design starts off fairly tame, and stays tame for the boss-oriented levels, but progresses to become more and more labyrinthine, loaded with twists and tunnels and intersecting passages. Even though many levels aren't that big, it's easy to get lost in them. When that isn't complicating the return to the spawn point missions, it can make the kill everything missions hard too, as some enemies spawn in once you reach certain points or accomplish certain things. A couple times I spent several minutes trying to find an enemy tucked away in a corner to complete the level. Even the boss stages have their issues, as some of them have questionable AI or design choices, allowing you to spam secondary and primary weapon fire to win, or just hang out above, behind, or below them while holding fire. Is this what professional wrestlers mean when they talk about working from underneath? Even with that, Forsaken is still pretty hard. The number in the upper left is your lives. Whenever you die, you drop all your items and respawn wherever you last triggered a restart point with nothing but the vanilla pulsar. If you die to a bounty hunter or mercenary, they can grab your items and use them against you. All's fair in love and wasteland scavenging. And those lives aren't for each stage, they're for the entire campaign. Based on how you do in the very first mission, you'll be set on the easy, normal, or hard path. And you're locked in after the first mission is done. You can't go back and try again without either restarting entirely or completing that mission path. Along the way, you can't save your progress after every mission, only at two or three predetermined points. You have to finish the first mission in under two and a half minutes to get the normal path, or under one minute 40 seconds to get the hard path. It would be one thing if you could see the end of the game on any path. You have merely wounded the beast, skirting only the very edges of the real battle. If the Earth is ever to be free from this metal scourge, you must fight further into the machine. You must seek out the enemy heart. But on easy and normal, you get a false ending and a notice on how fast to finish the first stage. I really don't miss this about older games. In spite of its flaws, I did end up liking Forsaken, and when the source code for it went public, I was glad to see it get picked up by fans and reworked into Project X, which is the PC version reworked to work on modern PC, Linux, and Mac platforms. Also, congratulations if you made it to the end of the video without ending up like this. Ooh.